Hello, I'm Patrick Landish, a research scientist with the University of Minnesota, and I'm excited to present the recent work my co-authors and I have been conducting on riparian assessment of landscape characteristics within Great Lakes watersheds. Here's a brief outline for today's talk. We'll introduce you to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and some background on our interest in brook trout conservation. We'll cover the riparian analysis conducted in Minnesota and look at other landscape characteristics across the entire Great Lakes Basin. Then we'll dive into some results from our fish modeling and what next steps look like. So the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, or GLRI, is the largest investment in the Great Lakes in the last two decades to strategically target the biggest threats to its ecosystem and accelerate progress towards long-term goals. Protecting and restoring habitat for native species, such as brook trout, is one of the primary goals of GLRI. The Great Lakes region is included in HUC 4. The U.S. portion of this HUC is shown here in green. Note that the most recent delineation of this HUC includes the Lake Champlain area in Vermont and New York. So when I say HUC, I'm specifically referring to hydraulic unit codes. These are delineated by the United States Geological Survey, and it's a hierarchical system to classify hydrologic areas. So on your right, it illustrates how they're arranged and nested within each other. So from the HUC 2 all the way down to the HUC 12, this provides a useful framework for understanding how receiving waters respond to land use and land cover and changes within those areas. Cold water streams provide habitat for fish and other aquatic taxa. The Great Lakes contains 20% of the world's available fresh water. Due to past and present disturbances, invasive species, and the continued threat of climate change, these systems are under attack, which require restoration and conservation efforts. One fish in particular that we're interested in is the brook trout. They prefer cooler water temperatures, Warmer temperatures affect their growth and spawning dates and can be fatal after a certain temperature. As you can see from this map, brook trout is native to a large portion of the Great Lakes. However, much of what we know about the species comes from the eastern region. So our research focuses primarily in Minnesota and Michigan. We do know that there are multiple facets to managing and conserving brook trout, such as water quality, quantity, and temperature, and are influenced by barriers to fish passage, competition among native and non-native species, fish stocking and angling pressure. So to better, better guide protection and restoration of habitat for these the species, our research focuses on developing an understanding of aquatic terrestrial linkages. We're focused on terrestrial characteristics at the landscape scale, such as land use, land cover, and disturbance that impact aquatic habitat. We're particularly interested in riparian areas. Riparian areas are unique, diverse networks of vegetation and soil and are an important natural resource that supports multiple ecosystem functions. These areas are very responsive to changes in land management activities. Our riparian analysis occurs at multiple scales. We used Sinanabud's National Riparian Area Base Map for the basin-wide assessment and we produced our own variable width riparian buffers using his riparian buffer delineation model. We're interested in variable width buffers as it accounts for the surrounding landscape instead of a simple fixed buffer. You can see here how a fixed buffer may be suitable, but riparian areas are not homogeneous. So to better illustrate this fixed versus variable width approach, uh, here's a stream in northern Minnesota. In Minnesota, it is recommended to have a forested riparian buffer be at least 35 feet and can range up to 100 feet. So let's apply a 100 foot or roughly 30 meter buffer. Now let's see, or now let's add just the updated National Wetland Inventory and see these wetlands extend beyond the fixed width buffer. And you can see that happens at a considerable degree. So after adding that to our riparian buffer delineation model, along with other information that we'll explain in a little bit, we get a buffer layer 
that better reflects the surrounding riparian areas. So for our pilot study area in Minnesota, we applied this riparian buffer delineation model to five watersheds. Each watershed had a streams, a 10 meter digital elevation model, and we incorporated the national wetland inventory layer, a hydric soil layer from the gridded soil survey geographic database, and a lakes layer. The lakes layer was produced by the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. So from there, we'll move on to land cover. We're interested in land cover within and outside of riparian areas throughout the Great Lakes Basin. The National Land Cover Database has 16 thematic classes that we aggregated down to seven classes. So this map shows the percentage of forest land cover within the four-digit hucks of the Great Lakes Basin. Note that generally speaking, forest is a more dominant land cover in the northern portion of the basin, indicated by darker blues, and less dominant in the southern basin, indicated by the yellow and light green. But if we zoom in further at the Huck 8 scale, some northern Huck 8 watersheds, such as several north of Lake Ontario, actually have a surprisingly low forest cover for the geographic location. Land use information is derived from the Forest Inventory and Analysis database produced by the USDA Forest Service. Its primary objective is to provide resource data needed for national assessments of the nation's forest resources. It allows us to answer questions such as how much forest exists and where, who owns the forested land, and investigates changes in terms of structure, mortality, and growth. Studying land use change aids, aids in identifying long-term trends in time and space. This helps guide the formation of policies or management plans in anticipation of those changes. FIA data also provides disturbance data in regards to tree canopy. So, in regards to forest disturbance, we use the most recent FAST disturbance data set created by Jody Vogler at Colorado State University using Google Earth Engine. This took summer composites of Landsat imagery from 1984 to 2019 and applied the land trender segmentation algorithm to this time series data and identified patches of abrupt change in forested areas. So here is the Minnesota Arrowhead region with all the disturbance events from 1986 to 2019. So as we watch this little animation, we can see disturbance agents of conversion, fire, flood, harvest, and wind fill this forested area of the state. You can see that harvest is the most prominent disturbance, but we can identify a couple notable natural disturbance events so here in 1999, this is the Great Blowdown of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area on July 4th. Roughly 500,000 acres of the Superior National Forest were flattened due to winds estimated between 80 to 100 miles an hour. The second other disturbance is the Pagami Creek wildfire. This began on August 18th, 2011 due to lightning, and after weeks of slow burning, it spread to over 92,000 acres during several days in September. So getting back to our riparian buffer delineation, uh, let's zoom in on a Huck 8 along the north shore of Lake Superior. Here we see the riparian buffers throughout the watershed. Now let's take a look at the forested disturbances. And finally, we can start to identify where, when, what, and how much disturbance occurred within the riparian areas. So we can take that and then start to understand brook trout distribution through this spatial data. So the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has been conducting electrofishing surveys 
in northern Minnesota as part of its long-term monitoring efforts. Sampling was conducted between 1994 and 2018. Within 174 Huck 12 watersheds in Minnesota, Minnesota's portion of the Lake Superior Basin, shown here in green. We grouped these electrofishing data by Huck 12 watersheds. Here you can see watersheds where brook trout were detected through electrofishing, shown in blue, and those where the species were absent in red. Gray areas represent watersheds where no electrofishing surveys have been conducted. We used a random forest analysis to identify which variables are useful for classifying Huck 12 watersheds into those that have brook trout present and those where brook trout are absent. We considered three land cover variables, percentages of forest, development, and agriculture, and considered these three cover types inside riparian areas or within the watershed as a whole. We also included a variable for whether the watershed has been stocked with brook trout at any point since 1990. We found that stocking of trout was very important. Removing this variable would result in a mean decrease in correct watershed classification of about 13%. After that, riparian land cover was consistently more important than land cover within the watersheds as a whole. Removing the riparian forest variable would decrease classification accuracy by about 10%, whereas removing total forest only decreased accuracy by about 3%. We also see that riparian forest cover is more important than riparian developed cover, both of which are more important than crop cover, probably because cropland is very rare in this region. So this tells us what is important, but not the nature of the predictive relationship. For that, we turn to partial dependence plots, which look at the relationship between the response variable and one explanatory variable, when all other variables are held constant. So this partial dependence plot shows the nature of the relationship between brook trout occurrence and brook trout stocking. In a partial dependence plot such as this, any value that falls above the dashed blue line represents a higher probability that a watershed will be classified as occupied, while any value below that line suggests that the watershed is more likely to be classified as unoccupied. In this case, the solid black line shows that unstocked watersheds with a value of zero on the x-axis are unlikely to be occupied, while stocked watersheds are more likely to be classified as occupied. This makes sense, since out of 15 watersheds that were stocked since 1990, brook trout were detected in just 13. This relationships illustrated by partial dependence plots become more complicated for continuous variables, such as percentages of various land cover types. You can see here that the relationship between occurrence and riparian forest cover is that nonlinear, but that when riparian areas contain a very high percentage of forest, about 92%, the watershed is likely to have brook trout. This essentially positive relationship makes sense because forests can play such an important role in improving water quality and providing shade to cool the stream. Finally, we looked at the relationship with development in riparian areas. And here's where things get a little wonky. The partial dependence plot suggests that watersheds with higher development in the riparian areas are actually more likely to have brook trout. This is a bit puzzling at first until you think about the spatial distribution of stocking in our study area. The north shore of Lake Superior has relatively few developed areas. Duluth is the one major metropolitan area, and as you would expect, the majority of development is clustered near Duluth. Now, keep an eye on those red, air, red and orange watersheds and notice that when I switch to a map that shows where brook trout have been stocked, many of those red and orange watersheds light up in blue as places that have been stocked, as have quite a few nearby watersheds. People like to live near healthy water bodies and like to be able to re recreate nearby. Thus, stocking may occur, preferentially in areas close to where people live. So as we continue our research, we will be paying attention to interactions between stocking and developed cover. In addition, the area around Duluth has had particularly low disturbance levels shown in the light yellow region. Our next step will be to incorporate disturbance data as well as land use into these random forest models to develop even stronger predictive power 
that will help us to prioritize watersheds for protection and restoration activities. With that, I would like to acknowledge that funding for this research has come from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. A major thanks to Sanana Bood and Anne McLean for all their help with the riparian buffer delineation model. We would also like to thank our collaborators at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and Trout Unlimited. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. If you have any questions, you can con contact me at my email listed here. Thank you again.